What an absolute unit, and that sound profile is exquisite. I am blown away. Hey guys, welcome, or welcome back to Proper Chuffed. My name is Hilton, and I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. But that is half the fun of this, isn't it? If you are new here, welcome to the channel. I hope you enjoy this content, and if you do, please consider subscribing, that would be really cool. If you're a returning viewer, welcome back guys. It's good to see you again. There's been one locomotive I've had my eye on since I rediscovered this hobby, and that is no other than Hornby's W1 Hush Hush, an absolute behemoth of a model with incredible detailing and overall strange looks. One of those strange sort of prototype locomotives that, you know, for me and my layout is absolutely perfect. Now there have been some mixed reviews about Hornby's W1 Hush Hush. The initial model when it launched was sort of plagued with technical issues. Hornby have actually updated this model and the newer one that I've picked up has the smoke lifting cowl and smoke box door. So I'm hoping this will be a bit of a redemption arc because after my most recent experience with Hornby and their class 153, I'm, you know, a little bit tentative about this and I've spent about 220 pounds on this locomotive, so here's hoping <laughs> everything's in order and working correctly. Further to this, and maybe the reason why you clicked on this video is that Hornby have updated their HM7000 app with new sound profiles. One of these being the original W1 Hush Hush sound profile, which I've installed and added to this locomotive. They've also added a number of different other ones. I think there's a class 20, a W1 refurbished and a GWR King class. Great to see the GWR finally getting some attention from Hornby and it's good to see Hornby supporting and adding new profiles overall. This is a fantastic piece of technology and the ability to sort of switch decoders and sound between locomotives and update them on the fly is absolutely brilliant. So we're gonna take a look at that today too. But without further ado, let's take a look at this beautiful W1 Hush Hush. So here she is then, the Hornby W1 Hush Hush with smoke lifting cowl. This is Hornby product number R30126 and I am more than excited to show you guys what this thing looks like. Let's take a look. Right, straight out of the box we've got an accessories pack. This includes some flanged rear pony truck wheels, her brake sets, uh, the vacuum pipes as well as some ladders and also the drain cocks, cylinder drain cocks. Uh, those can be added obviously if you want to. The flanged wheels can be added if you're looking, if your layout sort of has wider radii I guess. That makes a bit more sense because the rear pony trucks, the, the wheels don't actually move left to right. They're kind of fixed in position which I think is a bit of an oversight unfortunately. I think it would have been a bit better if those those pony trucks moved a little bit and these flange wheels could have been fitted on something for like a third radius in my opinion. Anyways, let's keep moving. Right, <laughs> absolute unit this thing is. Beautiful livery. I love this sort of battleship gray color that it's sort of gone with. I guess this is the, the prototype colors that it was used in. Absolutely stunning, I think the detail here these new molds and new castings by Hornby are brilliant. Um, the W1 has never actually been produced other than in, I think, metal kits, which are custom. So to see this as a mass produced model is absolutely fantastic. The detail here is exquisite. The riveting, all of that is absolutely fantastic. But let's take her out of the tray and get a closer look. This is quite a weighty locomotive. Um, obviously the sort of base plate is all die cast metal with the, the boiler and the body being sort of plastic. However, it really does feel like quite a, a, a hefty machine. And honestly, given that size, that is quite a big piece of machinery. <laughs> The detail here, absolutely stunning. Hornby have done a really good job with all the riveting that's gone on in here. This sort of marine boiler over the top here is such a unique looking thing and I think that's part of what makes it such a such an awesome locomotive. You can see down here on the gearing and on the wheels, there's just so much going on. Separately picked out parts all over and that's absolutely fantastic. Lots of different handrails fitted across the top here. Also along the tender too, there's a couple of fitted handrails there, separately fitted. Uh, the front of the locomotive is probably where things get most interesting though. 
as you can see, there's sort of three uh, lamps that have been fitted. I think a little bit of an oversight not to have made those light up. I think that would have been very cool to have seen this thing storming through the dark with those three lamp irons sort of lit up. That would be really, really cool. This is obviously the newer version with the smoke lifting cowl. So you can see the smoke box door is sort of recessed inside there instead of having that sort of hammer head that the original one had. Um, double chimney pipes here and the smoke lifting cowl sort of guiding the smoke away and up, which is quite cool. Um, jeepers, I'm, <laughs> I'm blown away by this every time I take it out the box. I think it's an absolutely exquisite piece of engineering. Well done to Hornby on this. What's great uh, on top of all of that is the fact that this is now commonplace. This detachment from Tender to Loco is an absolutely brilliant play on Hornby's part. It's made life so much easier with sort of double, double body locomotives, um, being able to connect them with just a simple like connection plate as opposed to screwing in that little bridge and then plugging in a separate wire underneath into the tender for pickups. The tender itself is incredibly detailed, lots of sort of separately fitted parts. The coal, I must point out, is exquisite. This is obviously a sort of new direction that they're, they're taking with coal, I, I would guess. Um, lots of sort of like shiny bits of coal, as well as some more sort of muted colors too, which is, I think, quite cool. Um, but, you know, as is tradition, I suppose, let's switch on the lights and take a closer look at this W1 Hush Hush in all of its magnificent glory. The Allen ER W1, commonly known as the Hush Hush, was an experimental steam locomotive designed by Sir Nigel Gresley, the chief mechanical engineer of the Allen ER. The locomotive was built in 1929 at Allen ER's Doncaster Works and was part of Gresley's efforts to push the boundaries of steam locomotive design. Two major changes came together to create the W1 and separate it from other steam locomotives of the time. The most significant departure was the use of a high pressure water tube boiler. This design was intended to increase efficiency and power output by allowing for higher steam pressures. The W1 was equipped with a two-cylinder steam engine, another departure from the more common three-cylinder designs found in Gresley's other locomotives. Constructed on a Gresley Pacific 462 chassis, the W1 incorporated an extra axle to handle its increased length. Consequently, it adopted a 464 wheel arrangement marking number 10,000 as the sole standard gauge 464 tender engine to operate on British railways. Perhaps one of the most iconic elements of the W1 was the streamlined casing, inspired by contemporary developments in aerodynamics. This casing was intended to reduce air resistance and enhance the locomotive's performance at high speeds. The W1 underwent extensive testing on the East Coast Main Line to evaluate its performance and capabilities. However, the locomotive faced numerous technical challenges. The high pressure water tube boiler, while innovative, proved to be problematic in practice. The complexity of the design and maintenance difficulties led to operational issues. In 1936, facing limited progress, the locomotive underwent a transformation at Doncaster Works, adopting a conventional boiler and three simpler expansion cylinders in a standard Gresley layout. The rebuilt engine, retaining an extra axle for a more spacious cab, featured a modified A4 boiler with new cylinders. Despite undersized valves impacting speed, it demonstrated appreciable haulage capacity. Initially dubbed unofficially as Hush Hush due to project secrecy and galloping sausage for its unique boiler shape, number 10,000 never carried an official name. Plans for names like British Enterprise and Pegasus were abandoned. In May-June of 1948, it was renumbered 6700 with a British Railways livery and on the 1st of September 1955, the locomotive derailed at Westwood Junction, recovering after repairs. It was finally withdrawn in, on June 1st, 1959, and scrapped later that year at Doncaster Works. One of its tenders, Corridor Tender number 5484, survives, and is now attached to number 4488, Union of South Africa. Despite these challenges, the W1 did achieve some success. It demonstrated impressive acceleration and high top speeds, reaching up to 108 miles per hour during testing. Despite a fairly short operational life, the LNER W1 Hush Hush left a lasting impact as an experimental prototype. Its streamlined design and unique features influenced later locomotive designs. The lessons learned from the W1, both successes and failures, contributed to advancements in steam locomotive technology. 
While the Hush Hush itself did not lead to a new generation of locomotives, it remains a fascinating and iconic piece of railway history. Today, the memory of the W1 is preserved through historical records, photographs, short videos, and of course, the world of model railways. So let's take a closer look at this W1 Hush Hush, starting from the back with the tender. This tender is in fact the one that made it to the Union of South Africa and is in preservation today. It's a corridor tender and as you can see, finely detailed with steps, separately fitted handrails on both the back and sides, as well as the top. From the side we can see the white prototypical LNER lettering has been picked out very well. There's a lot of detail here I'm really impressed with just how crisp this lettering is. And taking a look at the bogies too, these are metal and are very well detailed and die cast. Complementing the tender, on the side of the cab, the crisp 10,000 lettering, alongside some glass wind deflectors for the driver and fireman. And as you can see, the riveting detail on the top of the cab there is very fine indeed. I love small attention to detail and as you can see the builder's plate at the top there of the center of the tender has been included. The coal load, as I mentioned earlier, is incredibly lifelike and I don't think there's any need for anyone to go and replace it with real coal unless they want to be an absolute purist about it, to be honest. <laughs> and here we can see the tender connection. Again, I think this is the way that all steam locomotives with tenders should be connected here on out. It just makes no more sense to me to have those wires that plug into the bottom of the tender and have that draw bar fitted between the two. This is simple, effective, and probably a lot easier to replace should you break them. To me, it makes no sense why Hornby decided to make both rear pony trucks fixed in position without having any bit of give on either side. I understand that they have given us flangeless wheels, which reduces any risk of derailing, but it just looks a lot more authentic when you do have flanged wheels on those rear ponies. And if they could swivel left to right, just as Bachmann do with theirs, I think that would make a lot of sense and completely eliminate the problem, to be honest with you. But let's take a look at the cab. Another impressive Hornby cab, this is the second one I've had the pleasure of looking at, the first being the Battle of Britain class. We definitely need a driver and fireman in here. This is a very, very well detailed little cab. Regulators picked out all the pipes and valve work and little knobs and switches all over the place. <laughs> it's a really intricately detailed cab and um, it should be on proud display. I'm surprised Hornby didn't actually do a glowing firebox for this one, to be honest with you. And now we start looking at the side of the firebox. As you can see here, a really odd shape overall. Um, now, some people may say, okay, it looks a lot like, you know, the A4s as time went on. That was kind of the design that went for it. But really, this is the precursor to everything in, in, in Gresley's sort of design brain, I guess. And you can kind of see it all coming to life here. Looking at the banding on the boiler, you can see beautiful silver stripes. There's no smudging here. It's very finely applied and you can see it's very clean and crisp and I love that. This color scheme is so very unique and it really is a standout piece on the layout. I'm still confused. I'm not sure if this is a whistle or if this is a safety valve, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, but looking at the front of the cab, some very small forward windows on this design. Um, it made, I suppose, looking out the front of it quite quite challenging I can imagine at times certainly something we'd see later on with the A4 Pacifics but well detailed nonetheless taking a look at the driving gear here we can see that it has got a bit of a factory wash over it as opposed to completely clean silver gear there's nothing I hate more than a completely clean looking locomotive it makes it look far too unrealistic but you can see the real complexity here now I haven't fitted the brakes but you can see the sanding pipes are all fitted and nicely in place there over the two first the first two of the driving wheels, as well as all the valve gear and little switches and valves <laughs> and little knobs to turn here. I'm Look, I'm not an expert, I'm not exactly sure what all of these do, but um, they certainly look detailed and they stand out in that gold. Now I do believe those are the safety valves at the top there. A little bit further up to the front three quarters of the locomotive, we can see the smoke box and the lifting cowl that's so sort of iconic for this locomotive. Handrails are fitted separately and you can see the builder's plate there on the front of the smoke deflectors. The front of the locomotive is where things get really interesting and detailed in my opinion. Here you can see a separately fitted guardrail at the front of the smoke box door. All of these fine little riveting details along the buffer beam and especially the locomotive number picked out beautifully and painted there. With three lamps, I still believe that Hornby should have lit these up in all honesty. 
I think it would have looked absolutely outstanding having all of those light up and having that screaming towards you. Quite a menacing looking locomotive from the front. Very unique. It just has so much character and Hornby have done such an exceptional job in bringing this all back to life again. I think that honestly working from technical drawings and being able to put something together like this must be such a rewarding process in the end to see this model of something that was real come to life again. And just from the other side, we can see all the detail along the running board here. I think it's absolutely brilliant. It's straightened as an arrow. Obviously, it is die cast metal. So you can expect your running plate to be very, very smooth and, and straight and flush, which is fantastic always. Um, a little bit of a die cast sort of band there along the, the middle of the boiler. You can sort of notice that, I suppose. But the rest of it you wouldn't notice to be honest, only to maybe the discerning eye. For the casual viewer it looks like a full metal locomotive and really it does weigh as much as that honestly. So here she is on track, the W1 in all of her glory and what an absolutely outstanding locomotive she is. She's a real eye catcher in that beautiful battleship grey colour. I think before we run her what's best to do is maybe to sort of show you the new sound profile and all the functions included within. A number of the functions have been reserved for lighting if there is such thing on a W1. Unfortunately the W1 does not come in with any external lighting so <laughs> we won't be using that today. Uh, one of the cool things is that function 28 actually serves as like an auto running mode. So it'll kind of make the noises that you would need to normally manually input yourself on its own which is fantastic. Um, so let's put her under power and see how she performs. And that is the slowest I can get her there. That is your crawl with the W1 Hush Hush. And as you can see, she is not skipping a beat. No juddering whatsoever. Smooth as butter. Very impressed with that.
absolutely stunning. I'm blown away by the level of detail on this W1 Hush Hush. What a unique locomotive. So there she is then, the beautiful W1 Hush Hush. What an absolutely beautiful piece of kit. An absolute beast of a locomotive too. Like really, really impressed with, with just how big it is and some of the weight behind it. Um, I think Hornby do steam very well and obviously the addition of the HM7000 profile or an authentic W1 profile uh, really sort of brings it to life in so many ways. So if you're considering either the W1 or HM7000, I'm probably both of those biggest advocate because the two of them combined together make for a, quite a sort of visceral experience. I'm sure you enjoyed that as much as I did. I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, please consider dropping me a thumbs up. That would be greatly appreciated. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so. Um, you know, if you've got a spare subscribe lying around, it doesn't cost you anything and it would help the channel a lot. I'm rapidly approaching 1000 subscribers and that's rather exciting. So if you want to help me get there, let's do it together. Thanks guys. This week, I want to highlight one of my favorite YouTubers, and that is Martin from Donington Castle Model Railway. 
DCMR has become a weekly watch for me. He does a couple updates every sort of Wednesday or so, and then he also has some videos on the weekends, some long form, some short form. Martin's a lot more experienced than me. He's got a really sort of impressive layout, and he does a lot of tips and tricks and, and learnings along the way, as well as discussing sort of what it's like to be a model railway YouTuber. And it's fascinating to sort of deep dive into that aspect and have chats with him about that. Martin's an absolutely fantastic bloke. And if you have another spare subscribe lying around, like your other one, please send it Martin's way. That would be great for him. We're both sort of kindred spirits in our journey so far. We've both been on YouTube for about six months or so, and we're both learning as we go. Um, so yeah, that would be really greatly appreciated. Uh, go check out Donington Castle Model Railway. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the content. Until I see you guys next time, keep your engines fired and stay on track. All the best.